Uh, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I'm Asanka Basinger, Chief Technology Evangelist uh, at WSO2. Uh, so uh, before jumping to the topic, I would like to give a, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so I'm coming from a, a strong product engineering and product architecture background. Uh, so I spend most of my time building financial applications and joined WSO2 14 years back and contributed on product development side, especially on domain specific languages in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, integration platform. And then uh, uh, started the uh, external facing uh, technical task as uh, the first solutions architect and build the entire practice uh, as the uh, head of solutions architecture for more than 10 years. Then I moved to the CTO's office as a result, authored uh, a reference architecture called cell-based architecture, and then a reference methodology that if you are into agility, uh, how you can have a lean, uh, pragmatic, agile practice inside the organization is about the methodology. Now, as the uh, chief technology evangelist, I'm telling the uh, WSO2 story. Um, so I'm coming from an uh, open source background as well as worked on distributed computing and middleware developer and architect for more than two decades now. So during next uh, 45 to 50 minutes, uh, what I'm planning to do, um, explain uh, this concept about uh, quantum duality of APIs as a business and API as a technology. Uh, as a, a, a consultant, architect, uh, as well as as a developer, uh, these are like my findings as well as uh, experience gain working on many API programs, as well as as a technology provider, uh, we provide uh, API technologies. So we gain a lot in this industry. So my uh, idea here is to share that experience with you. So how I have structured uh, this session basically uh, into four key areas. Uh, first, we will look at the federation and business models. And then uh, we are looking at uh, this polygot and heterogeneous nature of uh, API development, uh, then modernization of the development, as well as how uh, cloud can leverage in this journey, like in both angles. One is a technology and the other side, how we can have a sustainable business around APIs. So those are the key uh, areas that I'm going to discuss during this workshop. So let's uh, start with the basics, uh, like uh, uh, so the products, because we as a consumer, we uh, consume a lot of products and services, as well as as businesses, what we are doing is uh, providing products. There are many definitions for uh, this uh, product, uh, but I pick uh, this definition um, uh, especially the one that I have highlighted. Uh, so it says its uh, product is something or a service that is uh, marketed or sold as a commodity. I think that's the best uh, definition that I found about a product. So the evolution of the products, if you look at it, uh, how uh, this evolution happened, I took this uh, word processing as an example. In 80s, we had basic typewriters and in 90s we use uh, some modernized typewriters and then it slowly move into uh, uh, the uh, different type of uh, paradigm with the advancement of uh, computing technologies so the computers came into the picture and they became word processors and if you can remember in early early uh, 80s that we use uh, word perfect as the uh, co-editor to do this documentation then uh, word came as the key uh, word processing program and now we are in a very cloud oriented uh, word processing environment even these slides i am using built using google slides uh, so the beauty of um, cloud-based 
word processing uh, platforms that you can use it anywhere as well as you don't need to worry about storing these um, files in a local file system. So that is one example of evolution of products. I would like to uh, look at uh, this same example in a different dimension. Uh, so it is about printing. First thing is about the word processing, output of word processing comes uh, in printing world. So if you look at the uh, evolution in that uh, uh, segment, it started in early days that people use rocks and then uh, wood related uh, printing materials. It went to printing machines and now we rarely use uh, printed materials that we use our smart devices to uh, read anything like uh, people use Kindles and then various other digital formats to read these different type of content. But one thing uh, you have to understand this evolution, it is making more uh, user friendly, but the complexity is increasing. Now the it, the, uh, the wood based or rock based uh, printing technologies are very simple, uh, but uh, when it moved to the printing uh, presses and then other hardware based uh, printing materials, it got complicated. Then uh, when it moved to more digital related content, uh, the inside uh, the mechanisms are really complicated. Uh, even it provides a seamless experience. So that is how the product evolution happened and the complexity got increased during the time as well as the consumer needs. So the uh, products are linked to this concept called a supply chain. Any product, it can be a software or it can be a physical product that uh, those are connected to a supply chain and supply chain is uh, the process that create these uh, products or produce these uh, products as well as distribute. And not only those two areas, even how you build uh, these uh, products, how you collect the raw materials and then how you connect with your suppliers and then how you market to your buyers, how you educate your buyers and uh, end of the day, deliver these uh, products into your buyers uh, happen on top of the supply chain. And not only that, how you uh, educate uh, your buyer, uh, various support channels, and then various documentation, uh, demo videos, all these type of content available in the same supply chain as well. So supply chain is tightly coupled with the products and without having a uh, smooth supply chain, you can't produce the products and deliver it to your end users in a seamless fashion. So the supply chain, uh, uh, like it got uh, evolved as well, uh, but if you look at the industry supply chain or the physical supply chain, it basically uh, contains five steps, sourcing, manufacturing, distribution, and after the distribute, you have to sell and somebody uh, consume these goods. So that is basically uh, the basic steps in uh, industry supply chain. There can be returns, there can be rejections. Those are like uh, sub uh, flows that you will find, not the main flow because assumption here, the good that you generated in high quality and uh, your consumers are satisfied with that. So that is the basic assumption in uh, the industry supply chain. And if you look at the returns and um, the, the returns happening in the industry supply chain is a small percentage compared to the happy customers. So with the digitization and uh, digital transformation, now we are in a stage that everything is digital and we call it as a digital supply chain. So digital supply chain having the same uh, functionalities like the industry supply chain, but it is different. Now, if you look at the sourcing is about discovering that you look at uh, the market opportunities, uh, consumer demand, consumer needs, um, what are your competition, all these things are in the discovery stage. And then uh, you identify a unique opportunity that you see in that particular uh, domain 
or a particular uh, target user segment. So that is the discovery phase. So we will be using many data and then even we might contract a third party company who will do that discovery for us. So using that, we will get some insight about what type of a product that we should build and then uh, what kind of a target uh, user segment that we should target, not only to market uh, your product, it's about how you develop because based on the user persona, uh, there are uh, expectations and then how they are planning to use the product will depend on your user experience and we are in the experience uh, economy today uh, because everything depends on the experience that you build so this discovery phase is really really important once you discover then we will go through the basic application life cycle related activities that we design the system we architect the system and we develop these systems once we uh, develop it it has to move into deployment that it will go through another life cycle like moving from development environment into a test environment and then once you complete this testing in most, most cases in today's rapid application development you will be using a lot of automated testing so once these automated tests uh, got through it will move into a staging environment and then uh, from staging based on your deployment strategy, uh, it will go into production. It can be blue, green, it can be canary, uh, those type of different deployment strategies that you might be using at this stage. And with uh, cloud containers and container orchestration systems like Kubernetes, the deployment is a uh, really uh, easy task today, uh, not like uh, how we deploy stuff in uh, the uh, mainframe computers or early stage using hypervisor based virtualization. So, but uh, you have to have a separate skill set to leverage these new technologies. So once you deploy the uh, uh, product, it is available for public and the, uh, the sales and marketing is based on product driven today so you um, put the product into a app store or a uh, uh, you release it as a, a website and users will uh, discover these products based on their needs and uh, start uh, consuming it before consuming there are some intermediary step that we will see in modern applications that we call it as registration you register and then uh, in most cases, there's a fee, free tier that you can utilize to uh, consume the service or the product because you need to know what it provides uh, for your uh, usage. And the, once the registration happens, you pick the correct subscription level and you get into a experience uh, or you start consuming these applications. So the... Uh, once you uh, start using the applications not like a uh, physical or industry supply chain the feedbacks are real time you provide feedback about uh, feedbacks about your um, experience real time to the application or the service provider and they will capture those feedback uh, as well as in most cases they will look at the customer journey or the consumer journey by using various digital tools, analytical platforms, um, artificial intelligence platforms, uh, so on and so forth, and uh, start uh, delivering uh, new capabilities or new functionalities as well as improve the existing functionalities by capturing this feedback. So this is a, a very uh, high level uh, look at how the physical supply chain uh, looks like as well as what we are experiencing today as a digital supply chain. So I would like to uh, uh, look at a few uh, uh, market movements. Uh, Mark Andeson, who is the co-founder of Netscape and uh, who's writing this very interesting uh, blog called A16Z. Uh, so he, uh, made this quote sometime back, I believe it was around 2018, that software is eating the world. So the uh, 
foundation behind this statement was the differentiators organizations are creating uh, based on the software. The software really creates the differentiators for these uh, organizations, and that's why he made this comment about software is eating the world. And if you look at people fail, like who had a very successful business, uh, that the use cases that we uh, usually speak about, Blockbuster, uh, Kodak, and Nokia, all these are related to this software is eating the world comment made by Mark and Lisa. And so uh, we have to pay more attention to software in the current economic situation. So the related comment uh, for that uh, made by uh, the Microsoft CEO some time back, he said every company is a software company because now if we uh, look at if the software is making the differentiator, every organization required to build software. So regardless of the domain that they are coming from, they have to become a software company. So it can be uh, a company in the transportation sector, or it can be hospitality, or it can be uh, food and beverages. Uh, not only technology companies, all these domains are uh, have to become a software company to leverage uh, these capabilities provided by software and then create that unique um, experience that they are providing which results a competitive advantage even um, uh, uh, the uh, some time back uh, there's this story uh, when a new employee joined amazon uh, i think he joined amazon web services uh, he asked this question from a leadership uh, uh, person about what is Amazon and the answer was Amazon is a software company. So uh, for uh, some people it might not resonate well because uh, Amazon is doing a totally different thing. It's uh, providing uh, e-commerce platform and then uh, into many other sub domains as well. But their entire business is depending on the software that they are building. So the third quote is from uh, Jeff Lawson, uh, who's the C CEO in Twilio. <coughs> Sorry, he uh, recently wrote a book, uh, Ask Your Developer, I think uh, a fantastic book. And if you have not read that, I would like to highly recommend that book for you because it is a really uh, good book about digital transformation, APIs, and then the role of the developer in an API-driven digital uh, transformation world. So he said, if your digital supply chain is better than your competitors, you will be in much stronger position to succeed because if you have a, a very effective supply chain or a digital supply chain, you can build products quickly. You can modify your products quickly, and then you can deliver these products uh, faster into your in consumers as well as as part of the supply chain as i explained earlier you can capture the feedback from your end users and incorporate it so that's where the digital supply chain is playing a bigger role in successful business so the new product experience um, is totally different right most of the products we download from an app store as an example, I took uh, the Apple store, but it can be an Android store or uh, a Windows based store, um, uh, any any uh, app store that depending on the platform that you are using. So that's the usual experience. And there are free applications as well as applications tie with a subscription as well. So that is how you get a product or a service these days. It's not only that, that uh, you can even buy a vehicle completely online. As an example, if you are interested uh, to get a Tesla, yes, there's a huge uh, a backlog that they are covering and you have to be in the wait list for a while. But then again, it's worth uh, getting a Tesla because it's the experience is unique as well as you are helping uh, the uh, environment as well. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, I uh, moved to a different topic. But uh, the experience on uh, purchasing a Tesla is totally different. Like, um, not like uh, you go to a car dealer and then bargain with a 
uh, a deal in uh, uh, these uh, different places to excel vehicles. So you log into the website, you look at the models that uh, uh, provided by the uh, vehicle provider, select the model, and then you go and configure it based on your needs. Once you uh, configure that, you just swipe your credit card or enter your credit card and then pay uh, the down payment and uh, get into the queue. Once the vehicle is ready, uh, you will uh, get finance or you will get a loan from a, a financial institute. And if you have cash, you can uh, pay it online as well using a, a bank transaction. Uh, once you do that part, they will bring the vehicle to your home. So that is a completely different experience uh, on car buying. After you do that, these vehicles provide various capabilities that you can just add. Uh, that particular capability as a software upgrade. So as an example, a self-driving or uh, autopilot kind of features can be added as a software upgrade. And then uh, even the uh, if you want to make the car to automatically open your garage door, you can even add it as a software upgrade, a completely uh, different experience, as well as the improvements that uh, they are doing uh, will come as a, a software upgrade as well. So that's how uh, you have this digital experience with physical products that uh, we use. And if you know uh, the uh, one of the experiences people experience in uh, a recent uh, hurricane hit the uh, east coast of uh, United States that while they are running away from the hurricane, uh, Tesla managed to increase the uh, battery usage uh, by um, giving additional miles for the people who is running away from the hurricane who cannot uh, stop and charge their vehicles as well as there was a power outage. So that is how powerful the digital connectivity with the physical world as well as these digital products are helping day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, experiences that we are getting from these different type of physical products. So that is the new uh, product experience that uh, we are getting uh, from these digital products. So the uh, uh, you might be wondering why I spend a lot of time on these products digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation, uh, as well as uh, digital experience. So where I want to uh, take you is about the um, underneath mechanisms that these products are built. So we call it as the API-centric architecture. And if you look at these two diagrams, you will see APIs at uh, each and every uh, component in the right-hand diagram and each and every layer in the left-hand diagram. So let's uh, start with the left-hand uh, uh, diagram. That is a centralized layered architecture that we used to use for a long time. So if you are, if you have been in the software industry for a while, we started this journey of application architecture with the single tier applications. Then we move into two tier applications with the advancement of uh, uh, the uh, database technologies and then the most interesting era came that is the three tier applications that we had the uh, use interfaces business logic and the data uh, access layer as separate uh, layers and then we move to sub patterns of the three tier architecture like uh, model view controller uh, mvc or mvc2 then with that uh, three tier architecture uh, advance into service-oriented architecture that we wrapped the business logic inside services and then uh, it moved to today's uh, modern microservice-based architectures that I will be discussing uh, on the right-hand diagram. So basically the, uh, the centralized layer architecture is a still uh, heavily used pattern in many industries that not everybody can move to a decentralized a microservice space architecture uh, overnight or um, in a quicker interval. So if you look at the uh, layer architecture, all these different layers are connected using APIs. And uh, to uh, make it more easy as well as 
make it more manageable and govern, um, I have categorized these APIs into three categories. Utilize, utility APIs that is exposing a different type of uh, data and then reusable components. Then the domain APIs basically exposing business capabilities as APIs and then edge APIs that is exposing uh, these uh, capabilities as API internally and externally for the application users, application developers to uh, subscribe and build applications. So in use applications are consuming edge API. So this categorization of APIs uh, make it easy to govern as well as manage these APIs, as well as you can scale differently you can secure it in different uh, level of uh, security levels, all these flexibility provided uh, based on the categorization that we have done here. And uh, with uh, microservices and decentralized architecture, we are moving to a picture like uh, you see in the uh, right-hand side, different type of components running inside your uh, enterprise, most of these components are running inside the container and there's a container orchestration system managing the containers and uh, most of the processes are stateless. There can be stateful uh, components as well uh, that we will be managing using different type of uh, technologies, but uh, uh, I would say uh, most of these type of uh, architecture um, is using a state less uh, uh, approach uh, and a few stateful uh, components as well. And all these components are exposing uh, the capability as API. As an example, if you write a microservice, the microservice has an ex uh, interface and most cases you write it as a restful uh, interface and it becomes an API, but uh, the APIs can vary uh, into different categories, like it can be a request response type API, or it can be a event-based API, or it can be a streaming API. So all these three categories uh, can support as well as can expose as an API from the component. And these um, uh, APIs exposed through components can be managed using edge gateways that I have put in this diagram. and connect with various systems, the applications you built internally um, for your organization, and then the applications, the third parties like your partners and uh, the other third party application developers built for you. And then you can connect with different type of data repositories and the legacy systems and every organization using many SaaS applications or CRM systems, HRM systems and various uh, core capabilities that you require to run a business. So all these things can be connected using the, the uh, architecture that I have put in the uh, right-hand side. So the highlight uh, in these two approaches, the glue between different type of technical components, and when it comes to the business side, the glue between different type of business capabilities in your organization done through APIs. So APIs are the connectors and um, there's a code that a company without APIs is uh, just like a computer without internet. So what's the purpose of a computer today if you don't connect uh, to the outside world, right? So same thing, if uh, the uh, connectivity is not there, you can't do business because business is an ecosystem business that you have. You have to connect with networks and network of networks to be successful. And in that case, API is the atomic component that you expose it as a technical API uh, from the technical side, but you treat it as a way of building new business models and uh, exchanging business messages, which carries many number of dollars inside these API calls. So if you uh, want to read more about these two architecture styles, categorization of APIs, uh, you can go to this uh, URL that I have put in the bottom of the uh, slide. 
it's called uh, uh, it's a it's a catalog catalog of reference architectures that uh, we have uh, the layered and uh, centralized uh, architecture and i have extended it a little bit for a segmented architecture that uh, sits in between layered architecture and the uh, componentized microservices architecture then i took the microservice architecture into the next level called the cell based architecture it's a completely uh, different uh, approach as well as more future proof approach and then we have a couple of other uh, reference architectures about cloud native and api centric that you can read all these uh, architecture reference architecture specifications are released under creative commons so feel free to uh, uh, comment uh, give some feedback send a suggestion as a pr or uh, criticize uh, feel free to provide that feedback and we want to improve these specifications as well and those specifications are completely technology and vendor neutral so you can use it uh, as a reference architecture and build any reference implementation by using the desired technology or uh, the technology that you are planning to use or uh, technology you are already using so the evolution of the APIs happen parallel to the application architecture evolution, like we use more technical APIs at the early stage. And I think uh, in 10 t in, then it moved to semi-technical APIs, like uh, with the message orientation, OLE, OLE2, ComCom Plus. And then in the open specification world, we got uh, COBA, RMI, RMI, Creator, DJBs, uh, WebDev, those type of uh, APIs. And then we got ESB, SOAP, people, uh, BAM type of uh, different service-oriented architecture era APIs, and uh, it moved to more managed APIs. I think 2011, uh, 2012 uh, timeframe, we started talking about managed APIs. That's where the business of API came into the picture. So I would like to give a credit to two people uh, about uh, getting this concept highlighted and then uh, driving us to this stage uh, first person is Sam Ramji, who used to be the, the uh, uh, I think, uh, technology says at APG those days, who evangelized the uh, uh, this business of APIs concept heavily during that time. And then the second person is the our API evangelist, that is uh, Kin Lane. Uh, who's the chief evangelist as postman uh, these days so both of them evangelize this concept and that's how we got into manage apis which created this concept of uh, api economy even uh, the foundation for this topic that i'm talking about how this technical or the technology and the business side of the api is connected with that managed api concept so uh, it has advanced uh, a lot today and we are in the stage that we call the mass api products as well as the technology uh, have improved a lot like uh, it uh, is based on microservices architecture and we are talking about service measures and then uh, east to west communication with grpz and then when it comes to north to south communication um, it's about uh, graphql web circuits async api so this uh, uh, api uh, has evolved a lot and as a technologies we can build anything uh, to match the business requirements coming from business side using these technologies so that is where as technologies we struggle a little bit at the early stage of uh, manage apis because rest and request response type uh, apis didn't facilitate everything we require but with graphql and async api type of specifications as well as open api as a, a specification now we have enough room in the technology side that we can provide all the capabilities business looking uh, from uh, the APIs. So APIs has uh, become the product of uh, 
uh, APIs have become the products of the 21st century uh, because APIs are the glue and then uh, the provider of these capabilities to outside world or the applications that you built. And there are different type of uh, uh, usage of APIs. I pick different uh, uh, organizations in different domains uh, who is uh, uh, pioneering APIs in the today's uh, API world. And then some organizations are using this directly monetization concept and some indirectly monetize. Some use combined physical and digital, basically how you can connect a vehicle with digital experience. And some use this com uh, concept called backbone for digital transformation because any digital capability connect using API. So those are some uh, different type of uh, uh, API product usage in the market. And products exist in and rely on an ecosystem because you have to be in that ecosystem. As an example, uh, when you sell a uh, television today, it comes with set of applications and then it's an ecosystem after that you have to download this application subscribe for each and every uh, service provider so uh, that's how it create that entertainment ecosystem through that particular physical device that you buy from uh, a, a company like best buy or a fries or whatever the electronic shop that you used to deal with and that's where the marketplaces are coming in handy, which build that uh, uh, ecosystem. Marketplaces are exchanges, right? It's not uh, one way, it's a two way communication that you negotiate and then there's a consumer and a multiple producers. So you have a better chance of getting the best product to the best price in a marketplace. So that is a difference between a marketplace and a typical store. A lot of people ask this question, what is the difference between an API store and API marketplace? So this is the main difference. Excuse me. So it's an exchange. And with this exchange, it creates different type of business models. And I call it as it enables multi-party uh, business model. First thing is called a federated marketplace that you uh, have different type of API providers and uh, put all these APIs into a single marketplace. And then there are partner marketplaces that you as the uh, key API provider, you provide some APIs and your partner network creates some APIs and partners and you, uh, provide these APIs in the common marketplace. Then closed group marketplaces, basically for a specific set of selected users, you provide these APIs in a shared marketplace, but it is not public. Then shared revenue marketplaces, revenue model can be shared across different vendors. It's not based on the a single API, it might be a collection of APIs or API products. And then the aggregator marketplace that you aggregate different kind of APIs provided by various uh, service providers and create a seamless experience on top of that by creating a rich API experience for your end user. So we call it as API composition in the API management world. And this is an example of financial sector that if you want to create a seamless experience for your uh, end users who's uh, like uh, sign up with your bank as a customer, you need to connect with these different uh, parties, right? That's it. They are the ecosystem business that I explained earlier uh, coming handy. Uh, you have to connect with payment gateways, mobile wallets, third party providers who's doing different type of uh, financial transactions, different fintechs who's running these um, uh, financial platforms, and then new type of reward cards, credit cards, so and so forth. So it's an ecosystem and all this connectivity done through secured APS. And there are different compliance requirements. So open banking, PSD2, those type of concepts came uh, to kind of have a uh, proper regulation inside these type of communication. And these regulations are differ from 
domain to domain. As an example, fire uh, is uh, uh, standards coming from healthcare and uh, all the healthcare providers are looking at how they can comply the APIs using fire and uh, have a seamless connectivity between different type of healthcare providers. And another example uh, of from telco that uh, telco can provide a set of aggregated APIs, but another telco can come and leverage those APIs and create a new set of APIs for their uh, service providers as well. So that is how this uh, different business models can merge and then create new business models using APIs. So this is uh, about uh, how we map this uh, physical and uh, digital uh, into API lifecycle. Product lifecycle management can directly map into API product management. ERPs and financials that we are using in uh, physical supply chain can directly map to API insights or API analytics and API monetization. Supply chain management is about API integration and enablement uh, that comes with the life cycle of the API. In logistics can directly map into API DevOps and the life cycle associated with that particular process, how you can take API through that particular API life cycle. And uh, we briefly talk about cloud at the beginning and cloud uh, is becoming an uh, accelerator for this uh, API development, uh, API initiatives, as well as the digital product experience that you build using APIs. And that's a, a nice uh, kind of equation in traditional way of you are doing stuff uh, with the cloud native world. And if you carefully notice this cloud native uh, a world is heavily depending on APIs as well. I'll pick a few examples. So centralized and a center of excellence based integration have, have, have has moved to API led decentralized integration. And then the synchronous request reply type of calls in the cloud native world move into more event driven async API type of stuff uh, like that. The entire cloud native architecture, uh, cloud native foundation built on top of APIs as well. And then the API Federation is uh, playing a role here as well. And uh, the gateways, the API gateways, which is doing the main communication in the API world has become a commodity as well. You can use any gateway, as I uh, explained on the right-hand side, any service provider's gateway can be used and plug into your uh, API ecosystem. So that is how uh, this uh, federation works. And then that can create a federated marketplace uh, for your organization as well. And we started creating a API federation specification. And if you are uh, willing to contribute to that, I have put the URL, you can take a look. And uh, if you think uh, you can give some feedback, uh, feel free to do that. And in summary, uh, these are the things that uh, we looked at. We heavily looked at the technology side, how the federation, sorry, uh, how the uh, polygot and heterogeneous API development can happen, and then how you can modernize the development and how you can leverage cloud as accelerator, and then more about uh, the connectivity between business and how you can build this federation and uh, business models and look at it from the business point of view, how you can use APIs as a way to add more and more value to your value streams and make it an enabler uh, for your uh, uh, business. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the uh, uh, API uh, uh, programs that I am uh, heavily involved they started putting the API analytics in a different way. Rather than you put a number of API calls, they started putting number of um, uh, the business value carried by each and every API by putting the dollar amount. So assume in a, a situation like that, if uh, uh, you lose one message coming through these APIs, even you can compute what is the business impacts. That is how you can uh, 
uh, tie this uh, type of technologies into the business and then show uh, the impact that you are making to the business by using the technology. So the contribution to these concepts, uh, I wrote a detailed article in the Forbes Tech Council. I have put the URL if you want to read uh, and find more information, you can go there. And as a technology provider, we are contributing to this uh, concept as well. Uh, so we have a complete API management platform called WSO2 API Manager. And if you are interested, you can go to this URL and download it. It's an open source uh, offering uh, that uh, you can download and then look at it. Uh, container friendly, uh, you can run it on containers and in Kubernetes environment. Even if you are interested on linking that to a service mesh, you can do. And I have put the components inside the API platform. And to do a proper link between business and APIs, you have to have a complete API management platform. That's where our offering. And then uh, we are enhancing our API offerings by using this cloud-based uh, uh, experience that we call Corio. Uh, if you go to uh, this URL that I have put, you can sign up for Corio. It's a complete uh, SaaS experience that Corio is an enterprise uh, integration uh, platform as a service that provides low code, no code capabilities that you can create APIs, microservices, and integration in a single platform, which is um, uh, uh, which provides zero trust, um, uh, security, security, and then uh, AI-based development, uh, and then enhance observability capabilities. So uh, this is the URL, and you can go and uh, find that. And if you would like to continue this discussion, these are my contact details. Uh, this is the blog that I frequently write, architect2architect.com. You can find out more information. And if you want to get some help, uh, I'm happy to provide some consultancy. You can use the second URL and then get more information about that on API strategy, digital uh, architecture, digital transformation, how you can connect business platforms and technology platforms, so on and so forth. And this is my email address, and I'm active on LinkedIn and Twitter. And these are my uh, LinkedIn URL as well as Twitter handler. You can follow me and then connect with me and have a productive discussion.